Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first WeThink podcast on digital and sustainable transition in the construction industry. Uh, my name is Tudor, and I'm coordinating the international working group dedicated to digitalization, sustainability, and procurement in construction here at WeThink.eu. For those who are not familiar yet, uh, WeThink is an online knowledge exchange platform where different uh, strategy makers from the EU national and local level have the possibility to connect with uh, different consultants, researchers, associations of engineers or construction companies with the goal of uh, improving knowledge exchange and discussing best practice examples that are related to sustainable infrastructure in Europe. In this regard, we have prepared a series of podcasts moderated by different researchers across Europe that will tackle the main challenges encountered by, by the construction industry because we here at we think consider that the researchers are having a fundamental role in the digital transition of the construction industry. So of course their voice needs to be more visible within the construction community. For this, uh, our moderators today will be Professor Mario Galic and his assistant, Ms. Hanna Begic from Josip Juraj Strossmayer, University of Osje, Croatia. And uh, their guest today will be Professor Tomasz Hanak from Brno University of Technology in Czech Republic and Professor Ivan Marovic from University of Rijeka, Croatia. And without further more introduction, I will now give the floor to Mario and his guests, and I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tudor. Hi, everyone. So this is our first podcast. I hope the first of many. So I'm extremely glad to have my friends as guests for, for, the, for the podcast. Tomas and Ivan, I, I, I will... I will talk to you as, as we usually do. I will not have this formal, so, and, and pretend that we do not know each other, especially I, I consider you as, a, as good friends. So how are you? How are you doing? What are you doing? This is what, what we should start with. Uh, I, I will firstly know, say that, that I think that we are around 15 years in the academia. Yeah, Ivan? Yeah. 15 years fully, uh, 15 years j j just past uh, this month. Or, uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting to see how things change through the 15 years period in civil engineering and construction management. So yeah. I'm re really happy to be here today and to discuss with you yeah. and, and Tomas as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is... The 15 years that that we are extremely privileged to to, to be in the academia. Perhaps I, I should say that academic work of 15 years in academia, meaning that we started our our uh, firstly master degree studies much much earlier. So, so uh, Thomas, with you, I think also that you are working around 15 15 years. Yeah, hello Mario, hello everybody. It's also for me a pleasure to be here in this post podcast. Uh, if I go back in my memory, I think it is now being 17 years. Oh. I am involved in uh, this academic life and working in the university. Actually, it starts in 2005 when we met in Zagreb the first time. So, yeah, 17 years, and uh, if you ask uh, what we are doing now, I would say I'm now having a bit relaxed because our semester has ended. <laughs> 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 so there is no, no more teaching activity at the faculty. And of course, we are now focusing more on research on writing papers, discussions with colleagues, but this teaching activity is over for current <laughs> academic year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel the same. Yeah, I think that even could agree. We are all looking forward to to end of the semester for have to have this this uh, let's say one or two months continuously to to work on on some some scientific work. Yeah. 
So, uh, first of all, also, I would like to thank you for, for participating in uh, this podcast. Uh, I strategically uh, said that you should be the first guest because you are both dealing with construction projects uh, in general in, as, as a management perspective. So, uh, before we go to the detail, can you please just summarize what in construction project management are you aiming to 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 work in your scientific uh, part of the day or part of the year, as you said. Tomas, could you please, Professor yeah, Tan? Yes, of course, up. of course. Uh, to introduce my position at the faculty, I am coming from the Berlin University of Technology, Faculty of Civil Engineering, and Institute of Construction Economics and Management. So taking into consideration the specialization of our institute, my main focus is apart from general, let's say construction or project management is related to uh, cost issues mostly. Yeah, so we are focusing on cost estimation uh, of construction works of facilities as a whole and uh, in particular, in my case, uh, I'm also focusing on the performance management. That's the current issue I'm dealing with. And also procurement in construction. For instance, during last five or six years, I was dealing with electronic auctions, which can be considered as innovative procurement route which is also applicable in construction. However, um, I would say not everybody like it from construction professionals. So it is some issue that should be discussed and applied uh, appropriately to get good results. So mostly performance management and procurement man management and cost estimation issues. Yeah. It's my research interests. Yeah, I would say that from the main criteria in construction projects, costs should be and usually are number one. So <laughs> we can all pretend that they are not, <laughs> but actually we know that they are. So Ivan, can you please just, just summarize in a few sentences, just, just Thomas did, a uh, few main topics that you are addressing also in, in project management in construction. Yeah, thank you, Mario. Uh, yes, as you said, project management is my major topic. Uh, and basically, I'm dealing with uh, various aspects of project management and project lifecycle management, mostly uh, focusing on different uh, modeling of decision support systems as a part of the decision of management information systems concerning quantitative and qualitative methods in decision making, especially in construction management projects. So basically with it, uh, we, we made a, quite a good team uh, between Rijeka, where I am currently working as an associate professor at the Department of Construction Management and Technology, and with Tomasz and his institute, we do a lot of collaboration together regarding these topics. So we are trying to, to let's say, uh, make a syner synergy effect on both of our topics and Recently, we, let's say, uh, ma made a bigger impact on performance management and try to develop a certain aspects in the, that area as well. Uh, but by, by uh, speaking about just the, the methods, we are, uh, here on my department, we are focusing on self-computing methods. Uh, so we are using the different tools and techniques and how to come up with the best possible solutions in construction management and basically the project management purpose. So yeah, we, we are very into the topic. Uh, uh, you said the costs are very important, but I would say not only the costs, time is also important. So there's our connection with you and the, uh, the faculty in OSIEC, but also as we are looking into the performances, there are quite a number of different aspects that needs to be covered as well if we want to see successful projects at the end. Of course, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Ivan. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, so, so 
let's say the main topic that I, I, I was uh, thinking that we, sh we should, uh, with you guys, discuss is the construction for all. Uh, I came across that you edited or still editing a special issue called Construction 5.0. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? How, how we are still struggling with the furrow and, and coping, wrapping our minds around the, the, the construction furrow and what it brings. And should I say, will bring in, in the future, near future, I hope, uh, to the construction industry. And you are now already talking about FIFO, but let's, let's put it firstly. So for, for the public, so construction furrow, is a, is a, let's say, a branch of industry for all, which firstly, it's believed to, to, to be said on, on the Hanover uh, Fair in 2011, I think, uh, with just recognizing what we already have in the industry as, as, as a whole. So the people on the fair acknowledge that now we are witnessing the fourth industrial revolution in, in, during our, our lifetime. In, in that perspective, uh, just a few years later, uh, we have this term calling construction for all, uh, with its main drivers, which are basically, let's say, I, 15 to 20 years are, are uh, we are dealing with, uh, with, with those, those drivers, like BIM, Internet of Things, uh, machine learning, uh, artificial neural networks, and, and so on. Uh, and then just put it under one term saying these are drivers or those are drivers of, of the construction for all. So uh, what are your thoughts? Because still, I, I think that in most parts of, of, uh, of the world, uh, let's perhaps be more modest, say, in Europe, uh, besides, of course, Germany, Austria, and some, some well-developed uh, industries, uh, construction for all is still a myth. We are dealing with only partial, partial parts of, of, of the construction for all. And I, I, I'm not sure that we are using it properly because I think that uh, construction for all will come with its main drivers, but in synergy, they have to be in synergy. So what, you, what do you think of, of, of the construction for all? What are your experiences? And what do you think that uh, is the main drawback that we are still not facing, facing these, these synergies that uh, I've said? Okay. Yeah, the, the, that's a good intro to the problem because the problem is not single layer in this case. Uh, as, as you said, uh, Internet plural is a uh, it lasts for the last 11 years, but during only the last few years, it got evolved and evolved. And we were looking a step, uh, one step ahead because uh, there are certain issues that uh, we are just trying to face with, with all of this technology in, in some kind of a human way, human centric way. And basically, what we are looking into to, to feel the, the need to speak about, let's move a step ahead to say construction 5.0 means for, at least for me and uh, for our, our particular special issue is we need to see uh, as a performance based planning as, as a sense with, with placing the human in the center of the problem. So it's a basically a human centric aspect of all the, that you said, EOT and everything else but also the, uh, the results that needs to be sustainable, the, the solutions needs to be uh, resilient. So we, we are looking into developing more resilient projects in our uh, built environment based on a large amounts of data and having digital group things. So we are using all the aspects of industry uh, 4.0 and construction 4.0, but looking one step ahead to it and, and try to, to, to maybe to, to make, make it a step further. Uh, in, in this digitalization age, is, is quite difficult for, 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 for our industry because there are a lot of, uh, a lot of data is missing. We need to first to collect the data. 
and we don't do it consistently. We don't do it. Uh, all the, the researchers are not doing it in the same way. Uh, also, the industry is, is doing it in the different ways, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So basically, what we are looking into is to, to define uh, some kinds of uh, uh, planning blueprints how the the, the investors or representatives intend to achieve their desired performance outcomes of the projects. Yeah, so so I agree what you said. The main idea is to is to have this uh, physical environment uh, transferred into the digital one, and then um, as a model, then we have our solutions uh, analyzed and so on, and then we bring the solutions back to the physical environment to to construction projects. Yeah. Uh, but but. Uh, we can all, I think that maybe this is a question. Uh, we can all agree that BIM is the main driver of, of that digital transformation uh, between physical and, and, and digital, let's say. Yeah, as, Almost. as a software, yes. But yeah. I would argue that basically- Not, not just, uh, excuse me, not just as, as a software tool, uh, as a concept of, of, of thinking, of, of uh, physical mm -hmm. modeling of, of the building and just of the building, of the construction processes as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of the processes, I, I agree, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Tomas, uh, do you agree with, with this? Because uh, this is an introduction to, to the main question. Uh, uh, my notion, and, and I would say that this is something that, that scientists are now already talking because if you remember from the 2010 to 15 the academia was so enthusiastic about BIM saying that up to 2020 most of developed and developing countries uh, will acknowledge and accept and apply BIM in, in, in construction projects but now we are facing 2022 and I will say that, that we have still uh, the same issues as we started. When you ask anybody from the construction process, let's say in the design, we have to also split these this, this two phases of the construction projects apart. In the design, I would say that uh, in some, some versions, BIM is, is taking, taking its place. But uh, we all know that construction projects do not end with, with, the, with the design phase. In the construction process, when you con when you contact any contractor saying, "Okay, do you use BIM in any kind of form?" They will say, "No. Why should I? I have the technology and methodology well done. I got things done, and that's it." I would say that my notion is that uh, they will do it if they have to. If not. They, they will decide not, not to even even consider it. What, what, what do you think, Thomas? Also, would you agree with this that, that we are still dealing with, with we call this uh, baby issues, I would say? <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And I also agree with uh, the notes that Ivan has mentioned. Um, generally speaking, I would say that sometimes I feel that not, we are not in the fourth industrial revolution, but we are fighting with or against this revolution yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a good or trying to push it forward <laughs> because um, in my experience, I can see that many people are really resistant to the progress. They are used to uh, apply some methods and it's enough for them. They don't want to do any kind of innovation. So that's why I'm speaking about some war with this, with this fourth industrial uh, revolution. Uh, another issue is that uh, I'm not sure if everybody actually understands what BIM means and what are potential benefits of its use. Because if you go here in the Czech Republic, to the companies and ask, are you using BIM? There can be different answers. The first can be, as you have mentioned, no, why? <laughs> the second is, yes, we are using it. And then if you give them the second question, 
on what level, in what, which kind of detail, they just say, we have this 3D model. Yeah. Now it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we are modeling it. So I think many people don't understand or don't want to know what actually BIM is about, which kind of benefits we can, uh, we can um, use or we, we can uh, have fun with. And uh, I would say they are pioneers, people who, who like it. Yeah, they run construction projects with, I don't know, 4D beam, 5D beam. So they are really uh, advancing their work. But definitely there are many people who will use the beam just in the case when it will be obligatory. Yeah. And there's uh, a majority of them, I suppose. Yeah, uh, could, you, could you also address this, this question? Uh, is the procurement one of the reasons? Because do you divide in, let's say, I know for Croatian market, uh, but let's say in Czech, uh, do you split procurement for, for the design phase and for the uh, construction phase? Yeah, yeah, it's typical. We yeah, it's have, additional. Huh? We have design, bit, build, procurement method as a typical one. So yeah. firstly, you are selecting the designer, when you have the documentation for the project, then you are selecting the contractor who will do the works. Yeah. But uh, there are already some pilot projects uh, with design and build methodology. They are very rare in the Czech Republic. So from this perspective, we are more traditional than Western countries, definitely. Yeah, uh, I would say that not just you, I think that most of the countries in, in Central and, and I would say even in Spain and Portugal, I, I would assume that, that they have, uh, have the same traditional uh, kind of way of, of procurement. And I would say legislation also, uh, as, as we do, I would say. Uh, but do you understand how can we add information to, to the building information modeling? about the building, but not as a, as a noun, as a verb, about construction process. If we do not have this uh, uh, constructor perspective and, and information that he is adding to, to, the, to the building information model. Uh, so uh, with that said, we have to have this, this con contractor earlier in the phase. So design, bit build, uh, his information will come uh, too late for, for, for any kind of, uh, usefulness for, for the BIM as a novelty, because uh, building information model then will be uh, constructed and, and uh, structured in the design phase by the designers and architects, I would say, uh, uh, engineers also. But they do not have this information about, about the construction process that which is needed uh, to, to, to have this BIM that we are all anticipating. So, mm -hmm. so how and what can be done to, to resolve this issue? Uh, I'm asking that because I still do not have this, this answer. And you said, we are the pioneers. I think that Chuck Eastman in the, in the 80s, <laughs> he was the pioneer. But now we are, we are I, I would say that we are at least juniors, not the pioneers. So <laughs> we, sh we should have this, uh, at least a draft or, uh, a solution to these issues. But I, I still do not see, see clearly what, what, what can be done. Yeah, you're, you're pointing out a good, good word with it. And, uh, it's all about information. So basically from the information management standpoint, we need to keep, have a clear, uh, th there shouldn't be an, uh, any ambiguity on data. So we must know if we're modeling this, what, what information is consistent. And there are some problems with the standards and how we use different standards and how we should use and define, let's say, bench or door or wall or this and that. Uh, but, uh, uh, th th there is a, uh, basically the first European uh, project about digital twin sphere was, was, uh, was trying, uh, the whole community around it was trying to develop uh, and to give an answer on those questions. And uh, th yeah, th th there's, they haven't got the solutions 
uh, still, but as, as so we, we we don't do. But uh, the basic of context of data is very important. Uh, the life cycle of the whole construction project is very important. Not only the design and construction phase, but what the, what about the maintenance? Uh, uh, very soon we will not build new buildings. We will not build new infrastructure. We need to maintain it, maintain it. So basically, we need to have a clear set of rules, standards, procedures of how we need to capture those information and uh, transfer it in some kind of digital project that we manage at the end. So th there's a problem with uh, the date, uh, the context of it. The problem is uh, scalability of, of those informations, but also, as you said, the procurement, or better to say, the contracts. If we are looking now into the beam, contracts are still quite unsolved issue to begin with. So everybody is taking, let's say, only one step in, in, in that uh, in that direction. But uh, should it change? Should it be a uh, in a should it be used in a different way. I think yes, because it's not. If we are looking to, uh, we can have a CAD model, 3D CAD model, and BIM can look the same. So it's all about the levels of information, uh, and that we all agree at certain points of how we want to put in those information into the it model. So basically, we need to have some standards about uh, ethics of data that we put in our models. Yeah, I agree, because at this point, uh, I came with my experience on, on BIM, uh, I came to notice that we forgot some somebody or one the, or the main stakeholder in construction projects, the investor. We are not uh, making this, this building information model for ourselves only. We are, we are creating it for, 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 the, for the, the main stakeholder, for the investor, because or the user or the final user also, uh, because we will finish our, our construction projects. We will produce, we have this output, a building is done. The construction site is no longer active. It's now a, a building which, which is active in its uh, uh, maintenance and, and, and facilitating uh, uh, phases, which last 50 or more years. and. I think that, that that perhaps that we should focus more on investor mm -hmm. and be, and leave our, our thoughts uh, and our wishes of the constructors mm -hmm. and structural engineers and electrical engineers and so on uh, just just aside mm -hmm. because the investor is why we why we structure and we structure our, our projects around them uh, dealing with their goals and wishes so perhaps beam is the is the main I would say drawback in, in this this uh, this form. I think that we will have firstly beam 40 and then we can we can uh, look forward to 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 construction for yeah, that's my opinion about, about, about that because in this form I, I, we have to agree that besides the, the the let's say disappointment that now is to 22 and still we, the, the using BIM in construction industry is not, is not a standard uh, traditional methodology. Uh, but I, I would say that the main main reason we should investigate in, in our relation to the, to the investors. So I, I just wanted to say that how can we even uh, talk about other main drivers such as Internet of Things, blockchain, uh, as you mentioned, uh, 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 digital twins, because uh, we still have these these issues with BIM, because uh, when you come to the to the same table with the investor and you say, can you can you say just let's say name five benefits from BIM, he perhaps would say I could see more clearly my, my idea, my, my future building. I could see the transition from, from construction site to the building. I could see some simulations of, of energy efficiency and so on. And that, that's about it. 
when you ask, I would say, uh, in, uh, stakeholders in the design phase, they would say, okay, we have so many benefits. Five is not enough. They would name, let's say, hundreds. <laughs> but when you come to the contractor, he wouldn't say, I would say that from 100 of contractors, if we could uh, assemble in, in, in a one room and ask them the same question, uh, I, I think that we will struggle after three, three benefits. Can you say what would you present to, to contractors uh, when would they say, okay, what do you think as an academic, uh, what is the main benefit to me on the construction site or for the construction uh, co contractors management uh, in, in one company that, which is basically in, in traditional kind of way, uh, uh, design, build, build construction projects as, as a stakeholder. What, 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 what would you say? You, you, you can either, Thomas or Ivan, how would you like? Yeah, uh, well, I, I will refer to, 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 the, to the problem where I see it. Uh, I think that uh, with BIM, we all see as BIM as a savior, ultimate savior for, for everything that's happening on our project, especially during the design and construction phase. And we are looking at the world percentage of uh, time and cost overruns. And if we're looking in at the overruns that we are have a 70% of time overruns in our construction project and 30% of cost overruns in them, the beam seems to be the savior. But with, with, with stating that, the client is not only to, to see these, these percentages, right? The client is. I, I would add, wants to show a model to the potential users or the buyers to sell, to sell his product. Uh, in that sense, when, if you are looking into the constructors, let's say uh, th there are, are some benefits to them, but they need to change the way how they see the, uh, the, the data, the information. Especially here, we, we, we are trying to digitalize the project. We are trying to digitalize the signatures on those projects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, construction uh, 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 documentation as well. But uh, it, for me, it all goes into hand that we are not doing it right from the very start. Maybe there should we should look into some kind of alternative ways of procurement of our construction projects. If we need to look at the value for money, what we are getting out of the project at the end. So DBBs, at, at this point of how we traditionally see them, uh, the contractor is not benefiting much. So probably if we get him into the design stage, it will be better uh, and there will be some huge benefits to, to the whole client contractor and consultants uh, triangle. Yeah, but, but I mean, <laughs> what would you say if, 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 if one of your close friends has a con construction company as a contractor, I would say. Uh, okay, I heard something about Beam, even or Tomas. Can you, can, you, can you advise me where to look, what to do? My, let's say, for that uh, period, his his uh, methodology or the top uh, that he he uh, he developed his his company is in CAD. That's it. And what would you say that is the main steps from transition from CAD to BIM, and why sh why he or she should 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 do this, or should I do that? <laughs> uh. Yeah, I would continue on uh, Ivan's wave. Uh -huh. um, and just, I would like to add that maybe the main benefit is, or can be considered to have data, real data on time. That is data availability is uh, quite important and it helps for instance, during the construction phase of the project to monitor all the activities 
and it also uh, helps to uh, or facilitates the smooth communication between particular stakeholders. And that, that's maybe the topic that we have touched and which is very important and it's the stakeholders management and that's uh, the issue of achieving benefit from the construction projects uh, due to the fact that projects are long-term issues. And we will build, I don't know, a production hall or the hospital and it will be used for decades. However, the contractor will be involved in the project just for, I don't know, one year, two years. So the period that is dedicated to the execution of construction works. So uh, from this perspective, uh, benefits are mostly on investors side because we can then handle uh, the facility from the facility management perspective, do some optimization or monitoring of energy consumption, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's not the case of of the contractor. However, a contractor can consider it as an opportunity, and I will give you one real example from the Czech Republic that happened uh, here at our university. Uh, our university was uh, preparing a tender for the reconstruction of one of the buildings of the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering. And they announced this tender, they received some bids from the contractors. And what was interesting, one bid contained a special offer. We will provide you the beam solution for the project and you will be able to use it later. So our university, which should be the institution as a pioneer institution mm -hmm. for beam application, was not interested in it. But this, let's say, uh, inspiration came from the contract contractor's side. And now we are really enjoying the, during the execution, we feel that the communication is really uh, very good. We can monitor everything. We can be in good touch with contractor, but also with particular subcontractors because each of them have access to the, to the BIM model. So the problem is we should understand what are the benefits. And if we understand what are the benefits, for all the stakeholders, then it will be generally considered and accepted as a good opportunity and we will tend to use the beam. Not just because it is obligatory, but because we want it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree. Uh, especially with the punchline you, you, you just mentioned. Uh, to have information at the right time. This is what I will summarize the punchline of, of the, uh, our discussions so far with, with this with this statement. Yeah. So, okay. So just if we would like to 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 to, to summarize this this uh, beam for all uh, part of this this podcast, uh, I think that we can all agree that still we have either a great expectation that beam cannot match or that we are not using BIM properly as the main idea. So we should leave it, or if you want to answer it, I would say perhaps to leave it open uh, as a, as a uh, uh, silver lining in, in this podcast. And I think that podcast that, that will follow this one. Uh, I, I would like to address one one thing that you you are dealing also uh, is the urban road infrastructure maintenance. Uh, how do you see that that uh, construction for all can uh, help such big public projects? Because we all know uh, the main public uh, construction projects are usually aim, aiming the roads, bridges, tunnels, and let's say civil engineering infrastructure. Uh, uh, as it is, so how can how can any of the drives that we, we all, all already uh, mentioned as a part of the part of the construction for all 
can uh, benefit the the infrastructure projects. What, what, what what's your opinion about, about that? Yeah, it, it, it can, uh, with the different tools, with, with different techniques that we can apply uh, to solve a particular problem that, that appear. Basically, uh, uh, as we are speaking about uh, information, um, gathering those information and doing certain things with that information to, to finally make some decisions to it, is basically all part of one big decision support system that we can build on particular layer. If we are speaking about uh, urban road infrastructure maintenance, as you, as you mentioned, basically it's a, it's a topic that has many layers under it. And we are still uh, defining a, a certain point of uh, how, how even to collect day-to-day -day data on those networks. And of course, once we have data, we can apply a different uh, soft computing tools, uh, we can use uh, net neural networks, we can use uh, SVMs, we can use uh, different other mathematical tools to see uh, where, where, where the, what can we do with it, or what can, can we do yeah. with, with it. The concept uh -huh. is, yeah. I know even that that you are focusing lately on on digital twins. Can can you please tell the audience about a little about more what the digital twins are and mm. what what are they bringing as as a benefit to the construction industry? I would say in total. Yeah, uh, with it, uh, the, the digital twins is is. Uh, let's say uh, a digital representation of the built uh, uh, digital environment and physical environment and we need to have a connection between uh, those two environments in a, a real uh, live day so at the moment we are i will i will be this open and say uh, as a lot of things with digital transitions we are a lot of things are we are faking so there are uh, the, the, those kinds of twins are very expensive because we need to put the sensors on particular po points in building. And if we put in so, so much sensors, we build too much of information overload to our uh, communication network, to our models. So there are still some problems, but on a smaller scale of, of those projects, uh, things look very, uh, very good and very, very, uh, interesting to see how will they, will they develop during the time. So EOT helped a lot, uh, smaller and smaller sensors have helped a lot, and there's where the, the these aspects uh, is growing. Uh, will the database be a BIM, uh, or will the database of such model be, be something else? It's not important as much. Uh, the important thing is uh, the level of detail we want to have yeah. Uh, to make our decisions at the end. So the more details we we want to have, the more complex uh, models are, the more complex communication network is, and the more complex uh, the whole this digital environment becomes. Yeah, is yeah. it solvable? Yeah, I think so. But is it cheap? Uh, not at this moment. Yeah, but I mean, uh, I was thinking about about. Well, the discussion that we had of, uh, perhaps two years ago, when you said it's amazing what you what you can do uh, in three D mapping with a with a mobile phone that we, yeah. I think everybody have in their pocket, and that that stuck to me. Yeah. And just recently, Hannah is doing her PhD uh, thesis, and and we wanted to 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 have this something to 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 to, to for the comparison without. Uh, Geodets and 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 that yeah. part of the, of our industry, and uh, uh, after we we tested with with uh, a drone, which is not not uh, I would say semi professional drone. Uh, we spent let's say perhaps one hour hour and a half mostly because I done that for the first time, but the result was was amazing. Yeah. Uh, the result yeah. was. Uh, uh, um, my my first thought was, I cannot believe that I live in this part of of, of uh, time of the civilization that <laughs> this is possible. 
done only from from images you, yeah. you remember hannah because yes of course the, the uh, first result the first results are usually let's say okay the the i see but we have to work still. <laughs> yes 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 we put them as as we tried but i say that the first result was excellent yeah yeah just from that uh, moving forward I would say that that this is something that the, the digital twins. I, I I'm sure that uh, the the this, the uh, construction phase and stakeholders in, in the construction phase, aiming the the supervisors and 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 so on, not just the contractors. I would say that they will, I'm sure, see the, the benefit from. Yeah, I, I, I'm very happy that you are uh, re referring to that. Uh, uh, our former thought, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, it's it's a topic that uh, was developing here on the University of Rijeka for quite some time. Uh, I started with it with uh, ten plus years ago, and we started with, with uh, scanning uh, our environment uh, in more of let's say hydrotechnical, technical geotechnical manner than the construction site, and the results were. Fantastic, as you said. Yeah. It's a close range photogrammetry with basically structure for motion technology that we can use basically with our, with our cell phones. Uh, I recently just returned from from uh, University of Applied Sciences in, in Wiesbaden when I have a course uh, uh, entitled Asset Life Cycle Management, and I, uh, I was I had the opportunity to teach students there about this topic too. So they were all fascinated uh, after the first lectures when we go out and we, we scan with the, the, their mobile phones, uh, some garage and parking lots uh, just beside their faculty building. So th the results can be quite nice together. There are some procedural ways how to do it. But uh, th the thing is uh, with it, you only capture the data. What you see what is what you get. It's visual. Mm -hmm. You have X, Y, Z, and RGB element to each point because it's point cloud uh, for that sense. But you don't have a model as we are looking into having into this building information model. So you have a texture, but you must add some kind of information to it. And that's where the database is open for you. You can build the database in this way or that way. And that, that's the, as I see it, the, the proper way to, to go with it. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad that you, you brought up the, the educational part of our <laughs> daily business. Uh, <laughs> with enough said about, about BIM, about uh, all, yeah. all the stuff that, that we are not teaching about, I would say, that we are working as uh, scientists on. Uh, uh, how can we expect that that uh, the industry could uh, accept and apply all these these drivers that we are talking about by themselves without uh, prior knowledge or basic knowledge uh, gained on, on the universities? B because I have to I have to be honest and say that my opinion of, of curriculum in Croatia of civil engineers is outdated for for this for this part. I, uh, perhaps some, someone might, might uh, say differently, but my opinion is that, that, that we, we have this curriculum which was five or say 10 years ago would be, would be up to date. But now saying about this, this, uh, this particular uh, drivers that we are, we are aiming here to, to demystify, uh, we, I would say we have outdated curriculum. Our, I would say my students are not ready for this. Well, what do you think, Thomas? And what, 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 do you, what would you say? Perhaps on the master thesis and so on, on the PhD thesis, yes, we are dealing with. But the basic civil engineer knowledge about this stuff is, I would say, equal to zero. Yeah, that is really hot topic. That's hot topic because... Uh, yeah, we are only dealing with, with such kind. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, companies or industry in general, uh, they are hungry for students 
with uh, the knowledge of advanced methods and tools like BIM, digital twins, uh, blockchain, whatever you can mention. Uh, and here in the Czech Republic, we have similar situation that the curriculum of the study programs is somehow outdated. And the main problem is not on the level of the university that, that we are not, um, we are not, how to say it, um, we are not willing to do the update of the curriculum. But we cannot be so flexible because of the accreditation. Yeah, uh, usually we have accredited, accredited uh, study programs for a long period, like five or, or, or 10 years even. And you are not uh, allowed to make changes in the curriculum of the subjects. So that's why it is like you have mentioned, Mario. We have, let's say, old fashioned content of the traditional teaching within subjects. But fortunately, we can apply these innovative methods and tools within the elaboration of the final thesis or if students can do some practical projects. Yeah. But this, this is really a problem and that's the problem of the national legislation and generally the university system, how it is built here in the Czech Republic. Yeah, uh, basically what both of us are saying that we have, now we, we, we poke the bear, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. We have this clear mismatch between our expectations from BIM and our effort in education, I would say, because we expect so much from, from the drivers and uh, we are aware that in, in the educational part on the universities, we do not have this uh, as a curriculum or the standard for, for curriculum for civil engineers. Perhaps we have to look in the mirror more and then, then say lower our expectations or uh, fill the cup with, on the educational part. Do, do you agree even? In, is it differently in Rijeka? I would say not. Yeah, I, I agree with you. But I also think that with uh, our traditional civil engineering education, we are building foundations, and that's the important part. So we need to be a, a good foundations because uh, it, it, uh, we are not dealing only with the new materials, new methods, new tools. We need to sometimes go into refurbishment, into repairment, into uh, dealing with all older tools, older structures as well. But it can be help us there or not. Yeah, we can uh, discuss uh, it also. But what, what we need to teach our students is basically about concepts. So this is the basic foundational knowledge. These are the concepts and these are the drivers of each concept. You can go in, in this direction, in that direction. And it's up to them to do it on the master or uh, as you said, the thesis level. To, to explore the possibilities of using these in the, with the new technologies. We, we are in the slow state of developing curricula, so we can, cannot cope with these digitalization processes that are quite fast. So in that sense, yeah, uh, as Thomas said, we can do it on certain levels, but basically uh, we, 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 need, we have a huge gap that we need to, to, to yeah, to, yeah. To, to, to try to go on the other side of it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, this came to, to, to my mind as, as uh, listening to you, what you said, just to refer to your construction 5 -0. I think that between uh, 4 -0 and 5 -0, it will not, the transition will not go with integer versions from 4 to 5. I think that we will have 4.1, 4.11, <laughs> and so on, I think, because uh, the transition is, is a sluggish, uh, I would say too sluggish that, that we, because when I, when I see what on the uh, IT departments they are doing, they are so far ahead of us. Uh, this kind of mismatch between industries now, uh, I would say that, that perhaps this is 
I would not say the first time in in the history, but but such an obvious mismatch of of uh, this integration into into this digital technology that we are facing uh, between, let's say, as I said, uh, IT departments and and construction. This is this is something that we will have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah, it was huge leap to the 4.0, and it's even yeah. bigger to the 5.0. But if we are looking into uh, the three main aspects of, of, of the whole, we need to make our structure resilient, we need to make our projects resilient, we need to make our projects with sustainable solutions, yeah. and we need to save the people within it. So people processes and performance are what we are seeking to, to, to get back to the, to the center of, of the flow. So human-centric is basically what we are aiming at. Yeah, uh, I agree perfectly. Uh, so we, we are heading to, to, to the very end of, of the podcast. Before we do that, uh, uh, Tudor, Hannah, would you like to add something to the conversation? Would you, add, would you um, like to add some, some, something to, or discuss something with our guests? I would like to add a comment. Uh, so perhaps we could maybe agree that the main mutual challenge of implementing BIM in later phases of the project, like construction and uh, facility management, and also implementing BIM and new technologies in the curriculum of the faculty, uh, perhaps the main drawback is national legislation, which prevents us in both of the ways to uh, implement new technologies. Uh, we can't really just choose the cur curriculum and choose uh, what we will implement later in the project. There are always some regulations and it takes years and years and a really long period to change these regulations. So maybe these two, um, these two branches, even though they are completely different, have this uh, thing mutual. Yeah, that's interesting. Coming from from a former or active student, yeah, I would say that, that, that I would agree that. Uh, so let's hear what our guests have to say about, about this. Thomas, Ivan, about the future drawbacks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it will be challenging for all of us, uh, both in academia, both in uh, teaching and research aspects. The research are uh, driving in the fifth, sixth year. Yeah. Academia yeah. is basically in the second year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so I would say that the premise is, is how to have this uh, one step ahead of, uh, in front of the industry, because you know university are expected to have this this at least one step ahead. Yeah, I I, I think the new people, new generation of engineers will uh, put the, the the will poke that industry there yeah. to go much mm -hmm. more in, within it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, let's say 15 years ago, when, when, uh, 20 years ago, when we got our first engineering jobs, it was, it was uh, we are, were not sure if we are going to get a laptop or a PC yeah. or whatever. Yes. Now it's basically, it comes with your contract. So we are not <laughs> yeah. discussing that anymore. The yeah. same will happen with, with this also. Uh, it will not be a question uh, if it, it, it only the question will be uh, which tool or which aspects are you going to use in your daily activities. Yeah. Thomas, you, you, you were looking to say something about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were <was> quicker <laughs> as usual. Uh, I would say it will be fine if we are one step ahead the industry, of industry as a universities. But actually, I will be happy if we are going hand in hand with the industry. That means with close cooperation with our industrial partners, because if we have a look on our research field, which is construction management, let's say, we are not speaking about basic research, but we are mostly speaking about applied research. So 
the things we are doing should be aimed for the application in, uh, in the real industry. And it's always good if you know what the industry needs. So this close cooperation and discussion uh, is, is really necessary. Uh, I will now go a bit more far away from our main topic, but this happened with uh, my research project focusing on the application of electronic reverse auctions in construction. Actually, it's, it started uh, due to the cooperation with our industrial partner. And uh, at the end of the story, both parties were benefiting. Me as a researcher with some papers, of course, but the industrial party partner with uh, understanding of uh, this technology by particular stakeholders that are involved in the construction industry. So I would say that this industrial cooperation with the university is core um, point that we should develop and we should follow. Yeah, I, I agree with, with that, but, but uh, one step ahead uh, was thought in, in the developing the methodologies. Yes, of course, upon the experience and, and cooperation with, with the practice. But I would say that we cannot expect that the practice will, will deal with its own problems. That's why the science is, is here, here. But I think that we can, we can agree. That, that yeah, but generally the industry can tell us what is the problem. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. And, and actually pro provide the data that we need yeah. for research. And then we can, on the Develop other hand, provide them some methodology or solution of the problem mm -hmm. they are facing. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, course. So, so, so that, that, that was my viewing of this cooperation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, of course, of course. Uh, usually, uh, we have this um, sometimes that we are uh, dealing with the problem that, uh, firstly, we have the solution and then looking for the problem. That, that's the opposite side that we should, we should do it, usually. So, Tudor. Uh, or, or not having a problem at all. <laughs> yeah, we have problems, always, always, yeah. So Tudor, you, you were looking also to, to, to add something to the discussion, please do. Yes, uh, thank you, Mario. So I must confess that uh, I wanted to raise two questions for, for Ivan, uh, Thomas, and even you, Mario Rohana, but uh, due to this really interesting inputs that uh, you've uh, put on the table today, I, I have another one and I would like to start yeah. with, with this okay. one. Uh, so we all agree that BIM is the main driver of let's say, digital transition uh, construction 4.0 as a concept of thinking, as, as you said, Mario. But then comes the problem of raising awareness of BIM benefits, uh, as uh, Tomas, you uh, perfectly summed up. So my question would be for you guys, is there a possibility to convince contractors or even national authorities to implement BIM solutions if BIM is not mandatory or let's say the only way would be, or the best way would be that EU, European Commission establishing, uh, first of all, a clear legal framework so that national authorities would then be pressured to implement uh, those BIM standards. I'm really curious on your thoughts about this, first of all. That's a good question, yeah. Ivan, Thomas? Yeah, uh, I, I think that we need to, to speak the same language about the information. So basically the standards of, of, of standardization of those inputs uh, is uh, step one. Um, step two in my mind will be the clear uh, uh, sense of uh, ethics and privacy of those informations to the all parties involved in our construction projects. So if th those two things are set in this way or, or other way, uh, basically that will be a good starting point for either go with, with, within the industry or going from the legislation point of view. So I, I, I don't, as a researcher, I don't care. <laughs> Let's say I don't care uh, from which point is it coming, but I think it's important that uh, that there should, shouldn't be any ambiguity of data. The data should be clear. Uh, and also ethics and privacy are, are of utmost importance. 
So uh, it, maybe it will needs to change some contracting aspects. Maybe it will need to change some, how the stakeholders are coming to the project uh, and what they want as a final performance of, of the project. But it's it's I, I I don't see that it will be go uh, it will go slow. Uh, I think it will uh, it it is it, it's happening right now, but uh, without a clear sense of, of those information that I uh, yeah. said. Yeah. Yeah, Thomas. Well, yeah, yeah, I would I would say there are maybe three directions that will support um, more frequent implementation or adoption of BIM in future. Uh, firstly, of course, it is uh, some legislative framework that will tend to make the use of BIM obligatory. Here in the Czech Republic, we are expecting that uh, the next year, 2023, it will happen for the large public contracts, I think above about 6 million euros approximately. So definitely this pressure from the government should be here. Secondly, I think that there will be a new stream coming from uh, or coming with the new generation, I mean graduates of the faculties of civil engineering that will be educated uh, in this area and they will come to the companies with these new visions, new knowledge uh, that will help to make the adoption and um, implementation of BIM in companies easier. And thirdly, I think the combination of these two streams, that means uh, the knowledge of the young generation and this legislation, let's say pressure from the side of the government will create uh, some awareness about the benefits. It will create some knowledge how to use it. And I think in this way, uh, the application of BIM will naturally, naturally be wider in future. Uh, so it means that it, we will not use it just in obligatory cases, but we will also use it voluntarily because we will know and we will understand that we can benefit by increased productivity, increased performance, or whatever else. So I'm optimistic, <laughs> as, as, as you know, as you know. <laughs> uh, but I'm not speaking about the time frame, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> That's really political of you. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to that, I think that, that our guests, I would say, answered your question perfectly. I, I have nothing to add, uh, except perhaps, I'm eager to know, did the transition from, from more traditional uh, methodologies in construction industry before CAD and introducing CAD to that industry, did they have to answer the same questions as we have to do now? Did they have the same problems? Because there was a period of transition from, from manual uh, designing and so on uh, to a CAD. So, uh, I, I, I do not remember. It was perhaps 20, 20 years ago when I was a student and I didn't care less for, for, for <laughs> anything because I only remember that I went from, from uh, drawings done by manually to, to CAD and it was a revolution for us. Mm -hmm. I, I remember still that I, my thought was it cannot get better than this. This is it. That's it. <laughs> and as we now know, it was only a transition to, 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 to BIM, which now we have to deal with, with these, these problems. Perhaps, uh, as uh, Thomas said, uh, our students will have this transition phase and they will see what the problem is and with their open-mindedness and open heart, they, they, will, they will come up with, with solutions that we cannot uh, at, at this point of, of our careers. So I, I share the optimism with, with Thomas. <laughs> Also, yeah. without time frame. It's <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> great. Yeah. I mean, if uh, if you think about it, uh, I think the transition to computer aided design was the, started, I think, in the nineties. You know, when for, uh, Autodesk yeah. first started um, developing the first softwares for for this kind of uh, CAD solutions, and but in reality, I think in the 
uh, after the 2000, year 2000, um, the construction industry and the design phase really went from this uh, manual drawing to, to this uh, automatically automatic uh, software design. solutions. Yes, design exactly. So we are we sh we should not be let's say worried necessarily. We should be patient and uh, wait to to for the younger generations to to be enthusiastic and to to focus more on, on, on the benefits uh, of, of BIM, of open, reliable data, having them in real time, which is uh, extremely important nowadays when you know, information is power, this is how, how they say. And uh, also I would like to, to ask uh, our guests uh, two more questions uh, that are interconnected. Uh, and there are, the questions are related to we, to we Think's latest activity, uh, because for the past two months, uh, we think has uh, actively engaged in collecting feedback from the construction industry uh, for the European Commission's upcoming guidance to support uh, national authorities in implementing major infrastructure projects uh, for receiving recovery uh, funding uh, that are subject to public procurement. And the focus in there was on identifying the main challenges and the existing solutions with respect to the EU Green Deal. So the two questions that, uh, that I have for you are, one, uh, in your opinion, what would be the main challenge regarding, so apart from BIM, uh, the main challenge regarding the transition to a digital and sustainable construction industry? Uh, and I want to give you some, some examples of the challenges that we, as we think, managed to identify with, uh, with our network of stakeholders. And there are, uh, for example, a lack of uh, an updated legal framework, the lack of institutional capacity from the public authorities, the lack of know-how maybe from private companies or modest stakeholder engagement. So that would be the first question related to, to the challenges, the main challenges. And the second question would be, of course, uh, what would be the main strategy pillar you would recommend for, for the transformation of the built environment in, in Europe? And also here I have some examples of solutions, let's say, that our uh, partners identified, like uh, awareness raising, uh, beam trainings, uh, regular conferences, technical webinars maybe, uh, position papers forwarded to the European Commission or let's say some lobby to, to, to national authorities. So I'm really interested in your, your input. And sorry if the questions were too in detail. And, uh, for we, we are used to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Academia, they're always one. So, <laughs> Ivan, Thomas? Yeah. Ivan, please start, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah uh, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure that, that uh, I managed to, to, to get, uh, gather all, all the data and form uh, 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 interesting answer to, to your question uh, j j just here on the fly. But so I hope that my answer will satisfy you in some way. So uh, if, if we are looking about the, the challenges of the, uh, yeah, I think that we are basically what's the most important part in civil engineering are the people. So if we manage people right, if we manage our stakeholders right, no matter what kind of tool we use, it's okay if we get uh, our data at the perfect moment uh, on the right time to make our decisions. And because without decisions, we drive our projects forward. So for that sense, I think that that's the most important challenge to, to, to deal with people, to work with people, and the people we will have benefits at the very end of the project. Uh, from the strategies point of view, yeah, you mentioned quite a lot of different approaches. I think that, that uh, education is for sure, uh, may, takes a major role in, in the pool, but uh, not just the education of the young ones and the students, we must look at the whole uh, life learning experience of the uh, present engineers, maybe some company managers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, will, will it be easy? I don't think that it will be, 
but uh, we are going uh, just the ears here are driving us forward and forward within it. So we as a construction industry must accept it as soon as we transfer it to some kind of a digital way, it will be helpful for all of our stakeholders on our projects. Yeah. Thank you, Ivan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, your, your questions are <laughs> very quite wide, but I will try to answer. <laughs> uh, um, I think all of us, we can, we can see and observe that there is um, a trend to make the transition done. But definitely there are many obstacles, or at least we should say it is not going as quickly as we were expecting or as we wish. Uh, regarding the pillars that you have mentioned, like uh, BIM training conferences, uh, awareness raising, webinars, et cetera, et cetera, or some uh, government or EU uh, activities, I think all of them are needed at this moment because we are not at the end of the transition, mostly we are close to the beginning of this transition. So all these activities, in, in my opinion, are needed. And I think they will work if all of them will be applied together. And uh, generally, it's very difficult to make some predictions what will happen or what we will need in more far away future because we are currently living in a highly turbulent environment. This is created or caused by many aspects like COVID pandemic crisis and restrictions. Currently it is the war in Ukraine. Uh, in this way, we can observe and feel that there is inflation, there is high price instability and so on and so on. So from this perspective, it, it came to my mind when I was thinking about your question that potentially uh, in some close future, like in the coming decade, we can potentially see some trends to uh, increase the digitalization in construction in connection with supply chain networks. Yeah, this is mostly, or this idea came to my mind mostly because of this COVID pandemic, because of the lack of materials, because the problems with the prices uh, of materials, etc. So I suppose that uh, as a response to current problems, there will be a uh, tend to increase the digitalization and also automation uh, in this area. So generally speaking, I would say it is something like interconnection between building information modeling, between BIM models and supply change, chains. So in that way, we will be able to create automated demand or even order for construction materials from the suppliers. So this is maybe some vision that will be realized in the future. Yeah, I agree. You summarize it pretty, pretty well, the, the, the answer <laughs> on both questions. Thank you, Tomas. I think, Tudor, you can be also satisfied with, with the answers. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's right. I mean, uh, what uh, both Ivan and Tomas uh, said is uh, straight, really straightforward. I mean, there's no one straight, clear path for improving digital transition that is clear. But at the same time, um, it's clear that BIM has uh, done a, a huge step uh, ahead. And uh, I think that uh, before uh, we go into construct from construction 4.0 to construction 5.0, say so, I think we first of all need to, to see how we could improve um, BIM usage, BIM standards, uh, getting some uh, uh, international standardized system. Um, convincing private companies to invest in BIM solutions because this is one of the also one of the challenges that we encountered while 
uh, interviewing different uh, construction companies and a lot of them said, okay, why should I use BIM if it's not mandatory? Because uh, of course I would have some long-term benefits, but on, on a short time, I need to hire a guy that knows BIM. I need to train, that guy needs to train in terms of the people that are using BIM. And what are the, the, the uh, short-term benefits for, uh, from, for me? And this is something uh, that we, uh, we should try to uh, push BIM and convince these people that uh, it's, it's, it, on, on, if we manage to envision the long-term benefits uh, for, the, for, the, for the building of the construction process, uh, they will all have, they will definitely reduce their costs on, on long term. So it's all about the capacity to, to envision a long term strategy. And uh, there are, of course, there are a lot of companies that are, are familiar and are eager to implement BIM and have been training on BIM and have been software solutions and participating in conferences. But at the same time, there is a lot of reluctance uh, for BIM usage. Uh, also because they don't know uh, what BIM type of software should they use, why should they use that, uh, does that uh, BIM specific software uh, ensure their, um, they, they could get some, I don't know, they would improve their, their business uh, on, in, in a short period of time. So these are questions that people that from the construction uh, industry, from the private construction sector uh, addressed us and this is one of the main reasons we wanted to have this podcast with, with researchers so that they are uh, definitely better prepared than us and they could uh, share their input with us from, from uh, the academic perspective and they can present their thorough experience with, uh, with this kind of, of uh, digital solutions. And I, that's why I'm very grateful that I managed, we managed to, to have this discussion here today. Okay, thank you, Tudor. Thank you, Mario. So, uh, for the last ideas, do you have anything to add? I think that that everything that I, I plan to to discuss with you, uh, we discussed it, and I think that that we addressed the, the right questions and and perhaps help the, the the audience to 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 absorb some kind of point of views of ours uh, on the on the main topics such as construction for all, beam digital twins, problems with the universities, curriculums, and so on. And, and this is something that we will, in this podcast series that I, I hope that we will, we will establish, uh, will address. So should I announce the, the, the second one or not? Yes, in the second yes, one, we will, get, we will host uh, a former student of civil engineering here on the master's degree in Osijek. He is now studying architecture in Denmark, in Copenhagen. So I'm eager to, to, to discuss basically the same uh, premises that we, we discussed at, at this one. So I, I'm eager to see what is the student's po point of view on, on the main questions regarding beam, construction for all, transitions, and so on. So I, I, if this is it, I would like to thank our guests. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you. I thank you. hope that you will... You will uh, that we will have this opportunity to 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 host you again at our podcast. Let's say with two two digits number or three, who knows? <laughs> uh, and and for the first one, I'm I'm really really and honestly uh, grateful that you accepted it because there is no better way to start than start with friends, and I, I consider you both as, as good friends. So this is Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mario, for the invitation, and uh, it was nice to, to, to discuss with you and all of you here about these questions. Thank you. I, I would like to also thank you so much uh, for the invitation. It was my pleasure, and I would say I spent really a pleasant hour here <laughs> with all of you, and also with very interesting discussion on the topic. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Hannah, also for, for the for the work. Uh, you put effort in, in structuring the questions and, and work on the strategy. Also, you added it to, to the discussion. So, Tudor, also thank you. Thank you for the for the moderating and organizing the, the these podcasts. Thank so, you. Thank you thank very you. much, Mario. Thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, Ivan. It was a really great session. Uh, 
just wanted to add that the podcast will be added in short time on our weekly platform in the construction working group and will also be li- added on LinkedIn. Uh, we're also thinking about uh, Spotify and some other ways of, of promoting our, our podcast so that anyone who might be interested can access it. Additionally, we are thinking of preparing a short uh, document that will map the main ideas that we discuss here so that people can also have the opportunity of seeing the main points we have discussed here if they don't have, let's say, enough time to watch the entire podcast. And uh, thank you very much and looking forward to our next uh, podcast, uh, Sonia. So thank you guys and have a great day. Yeah, you also. Thank you, Peter.